start. So welcome everyone and thanks for coming despite it's being both Friday and December. And of course, thanks to our guest, Dr. Inbal Becker Rashev, for agreeing to give a talk at such a short notice. So let me briefly introduce our speaker. Dr. Inbal Becker Rashev is a geographer, professor at the University of Maryland in College Park, you know, the other university in the state of Maryland and the director of the NASA Harvest Program, NASA Agriculture Program, and also work closely with various partners to initiate the G20 GeoGLAM, Geo Global Agricultural Monitoring Initiative that was adopted in 2011. And within this initiative, she is a program scientist at the GeoGLAM Secretariat and leads the Crop Monitor Initiative, providing monthly global crop assessments and early warnings of areas of potential crop production shortfalls. And on top of all this, she is also the author and co-author of many academic publications that focus on food security, remote sensing, and crop and agricultural monitoring. So we will do it in our usual way. In Bali, we'll give a presentation of about 25, 30 minutes, and then we will open it up for a Q&A. So, well, thanks for joining us and the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. I guess I should do that. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's a real big pleasure to to be here. Um, and so I'll maybe I'll stand so I can see oh. the, oh, but then the microphone won't. No, work. there is this one. Oh, okay, great. So I'll turn to myself over here. Great. Thanks. So I'll start by giving a, a brief introduction about NASA Harvest, why we even care about all these kinds of topics. What does satellites and, and uh, looking at the Earth from space have to do with, with any of this? And then I'll primarily then focus the rest of the presentation on specifically on, on working on Ukraine. And so I think probably most of you are very well aware that today food security or insecurity rather is one of the biggest challenges that we face today. Those of you who are familiar with the sustainable development goals will know the goal two of zero hunger. We are only getting further and further away from that goal. Um, and at the moment, we know we are actually uh, facing unprecedented levels of food insecurity globally for many reasons, including armed conflict, including climate, including following the, the, the pandemic. Um, and so we really need to have innovation in terms of how we can develop robust and scalable information that is transparent, that is global, to provide us information and data about our uh, global croplands and production. So... Um, in that context, um, NASA Harvest was launched in 2017. This is a um, NASA program. It sits in, in uh, what's called Applied Sciences within Earth Science. And our main mission is ultimately to help advance the use of Earth observations of satellite data and, and technologies, both for public and private sectors, ultimately to help inform decisions, whether we're talking about markets, whether we're talking about food security or sustainability. And we're set up uh, and in terms of a consortium. We have over four, 50 different partners. Many of their logos are here. This is not even comprehensive. And we sit at University of Maryland, so we're a little bit of a different structure. It was, it was initially an experiment for NASA to build our program in that way. It meant we could be a government program sitting outside government, which meant we could partner with foreign governments, with UN organizations, with private sector, much easier than we could had we been sitting directly at NASA headquarters. And so ultimately, our goal is to help to translate data into actionable information to support these kinds of decisions, to get that information into the hands of decision makers when they need it in the form that they need that. Right? And for many of you will probably know that we're in very rapidly changing space in terms of satellite data. We have lots of satellites that are going around the Earth continuously acquiring data in many different wavelengths, those that we can visibly see, but many of those that we can't see. And that provides us a lot of different kinds of information about the Earth's surface, about the atmosphere, about how things are changing. And we basically can monitor every field across the globe on a near daily basis, okay? And so what are kinds of areas of impact that we're interested in looking at with satellite data? I've listed a few of those here. These are areas we're very much focused on within the NASA Harvest Program. I'm not gonna have time to talk about 
all of these, but I'll give some examples. And so some of it is having to do with transparency for agricultural markets, for trade, right? That's really important that we have information about where we might have shortfalls, where we'll have surpluses and having, we have a global food system. So it's important for us to have a global perspective. Rapid response capacity, and I'll talk more about that when I get to the, to the example of Ukraine. Early warning, right? Information about early warning that can lead to early action, um, et cetera. And so one of the things that we um, coordinate under the G20 Geoglam initiative um, is providing on a monthly basis global crop condition information. This builds on a consensus from around 40 different organizations that come together every month to provide us information about what do global crop conditions look like. And so this is a map of our, our last uh, assessment. The next one's gonna be actually coming out on Thursday. And the idea here is actually we worked a lot with economists within the, the, the G20 framework to come up with these. And so the idea was how do we provide information in a very simple way? This is actually extremely complicated information in terms of coming up with this kind of a map, but ultimately being able to provide information that very simply, you can look at this as kind of like a, a, um, a quick assessment and see anywhere that's green means things are about normal, okay? Uh, anywhere that's yellow is we have a warning. There could be developing some uh, some risk to production. In that case, we'll give you an icon of what is the crop that's being impacted. Red means that it's already in, in poor condition. And so very quickly, you can have a global view of what's happening. What are the crops being impacted? We also provide information on what are the climatic drivers or whether it's conflict drivers as well. And these come out on three operational monthly bulletins. Um, on the first Thursday of the month um, and are used by a lot of different organizations and governments, whether it's governments, whether it's UN organizations, aid organizations, um, to inform various decisions. And ultimately the goal is to provide more transparency, to reduce uncertainty and to all be working off of um, the same kind of information. Um, and so one of the things that we did building on this is also moving these down into national countries. And in particular, there was a large focus on, on working in Africa, where these are end user driven. They've taken the concept of the crop monitors. These are run by the countries on a monthly basis, according to their needs, according to their timelines, according to their own crops, because we're ultimately not in the business in terms of um, running analyses. So, so we are at that at the global scale and bringing that together, but really building up that capacity in other countries by other governments to run their own information systems and, and analysis. Here are some other examples. We're working with um, FAO and the Ministry of Agriculture in, in Malawi on developing, and this is an example of um, running rapid assessments following Cyclone Freddy that many of you will have heard about back in March, 2023. They were able to, um, we worked together with them in, in developing some of the systems that they could use to assess very rapidly flood damage in the Southern part of the country, um, where about 73% of those crop areas that were assessed had total crop loss. Um, and so again, these kinds of technologies become very important, especially when they're in the hands of those that can use that information to inform decisions. Um, another example, this was a request by USAID. Some of you will have known that there was um, between 2020 and 2022, um, five consecutive droughts in Somalia. And so what we did here was map all the water bodies. These are important not only for croplands, but also for livestock. Livestock is a very important part of food security in Somalia. And so we mapped these out at a three meter resolution level. When was the last time we had water in all these different water bodies? Um, and ultimately could come up with, with, uh, with a map of when each water body dried out or you know, in some cases they didn't, or in 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 a few cases here, and the, this is what you're seeing in the red and, and blue, in terms of where it was water lost or, or gained. Um, a last example I'll give, I think, before I go into to Ukraine, um, this was a very different kind of request. We got a request from the government of Togo during COVID. They needed information for their own um, for aid programs into to farmers on where actually all were the smallholder farmers, and they asked us within ten days to map all the croplands across Togo, which we did, and then that was helpful. Now integrated into their program to look at how do they um, find the farmers and, and which areas should they be focusing that program on. Okay, I'll skip this last one. This is more about um, public private sector and, and working on insurance. Um, and so then we had the Russian invasion of the full scale invasion of, of Ukraine, February 24th. Ukraine is a global bread basket, right? So before the war, Ukraine was exporting about 10% of the global corn and wheat. 50, close to 50% of sunflower oil is a really important food, uh, food producer 
country. So of course, naturally, there was a grave concern about what's happening in Ukraine, but also what the implications would be particularly for global markets and for food security. And so <clears throat> we'd actually been working a lot in Ukraine previously. I did personally my PhD on yield forecasting in, in Ukraine. So we had a lot of longstanding partnerships and connections already, which meant that the ministry could call us very um, once the war broke out and said, can you help us monitor what is happening in particular in the occupied territories where ground access is not possible and satellite data becomes the only way we can look at what's happening um, in the eastern part of, of Ukraine. And so that's what we started to do. I would like to, to recognize that is, this has been a tremendous teamwork. A lot of people have worked on the assessment that, I, that I'm showing here, um, both on, on my team and also on the bottom, our, our Ukrainian colleagues who've supported this analysis. Um, and so the first question was, what proportion of croplands were under Russian occupation. There were many different estimates that were coming out, but the way they could do them is they would take the oblast level, right? Like you think of your state or your county, like this is the administrative unit in Ukraine. They took the average statistics and accumulated those and said, this is how much uh, uh, cropland is being occupied. But in fact, the front line does not follow any administrative borders. So we did that first analysis. And so what we could do back in April, remember wheat in Ukraine is primarily a winter crop. That means it's planted in the fall and harvested in the summer. So that means that the wheat was planted before the war. Um, spring crops, on the other hand, were going to be planted once the war already started. Okay, so what we could do initially in April is start to map where were all the winter crops, mostly wheat, versus where is there potential for all the summer crops to be planted. And so that's what you're seeing here in the in the blue and the red. Wheat is primarily grown in the south and the east and the center areas where you see mostly dominated blue. They are across the country, but that's the concentration. Okay, so what we initially find is about 22% of Ukraine's cropland is occupied by Russia. And then we can start to look at how much of the winter crops are, are occupied as well, okay? So then there was a lot of talk and speculation about how much of the summer crops would not be planted due to the war, anywhere between 30 and 50%. There were a lot of different media articles talking about this. And similarly, the same kind of proportion would not be harvested, right? The wheat was planted before the war. The fear was that's not gonna be harvested because of the war. Okay, so we start in here. I'm just focusing on 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 her son. The time was uh, was mostly occupied. Maybe actually all of it was occupied. Now part of it is liberated. And what you're seeing here in green are the winter crops. We know these have already been planted. What you're looking at in the red is a disturbance to soil. So we're looking at that tillage and the the sowing uh, signal from the satellite, and we're actually seeing most everything is getting planted. Okay, so and we do this here. I'm just showing her son, but we do this across the whole country. Um, and what we find is about 12% of croplands were left unpl unplanted in the occupied territories. The majority of those are very much concentrated across the front line. So as you get further away from the front line, everything is getting planted, right? Makes sense. Then we do, we had to recognize all the field boundaries because again, our unit that we're looking at are fields. So I'm just gonna quickly go through this, but this is um, important work that we can do with satellite data so we can automatically delineate and outline all the fields. And then we classify them. Initially, as I said, spring and winter crops, as the season is progressing, we can differentiate out different kinds of crops. And so ultimately this is the map we come up with. This is at three meter resolution. Um, we've classified sunflower, all the other summer crops are in another category, winter wheat, rapeseed, and the area is not planted. This is a map. We still need to do statistics on this to get actually information around, well, what are planted areas? I'm not going to go into this in detail. I will just stop at saying you cannot take the area of a pixel and multiply it by the number of pixels you had to get at an area for those of you who do this kind of work, okay? Because, and no, to look at this for many others who put out information about satellite data, be critical about what you're looking at. Okay, so these are um, what we end up getting in terms of occupation. We can look around 21% of summer crops, around 29% of winter crops, 14% uh, of rapeseed are under occupation. Okay, but to get at production, what do we do? It's yield times area, right? So we need to get at yield. And so we have different models that we run um, on being able to extract and estimate uh, yields. And then it's not enough. So now we have yield, we have planted area. But remember that big question, how much of it is gonna be harvested? So actually the area we need is not the planted area, but we need also the harvested area. So again, we map 
um, harvested area. I want to show you because this is something we developed for the ministry because they initially didn't believe our results. Okay, so here you have a field, June 1st, really dark green. If for those of you who are maybe sitting close enough, you can see these little white dots. Those are artillery craters. Okay, these areas are being bombed, are, are being shelled. So in June, it's greening up, right? It's come out of senescence for the, sorry, come out of senescence. It's come out of um, winter dormancy. It's full blown um, vegetation in, in June, actually almost starting to senesce. By July 2nd, you see that dark signal. That's the senescent crop, right? That's when the crops are starting to dry out and become dark. And finally, um, what you see at the end on August 9th is a bright signal. What is that bright signal? Anybody have ideas? What happens after it's been harvested, right? So it gets harvested and you get like this, the, the residue from the crop. It's this yellow, the, the straw essentially. So that field, even though it's been heavily shelled has been harvested also. Okay, so we have an algorithm that can detect, that's a pretty big change, we can detect that. So when you look at this at a national scale, and this is from late July, most of the, the winter crop has been harvested. What do you see? What that sticks out in the wheat area? Let me see if I can do this. Uh, no. Yes? Oh, it doesn't work on the screen. Okay. Um, what do you see here, right? This is our front line. Here it's all bright yellow. Here it's all bright yellow. Remember, that's our harvested signal. Here it's pretty dark, right? Do you see that? That's pretty dark. What is that? Those are not being harvested. Okay, so we see this dark signal across the front line, but everything else has been harvested. So initially, it kind of goes against what everybody was anticipating happening, but it makes sense, right? Farmers are farmers. They're going to farm. They're going to harvest. You're not going to let a crop that's there not get harvested. Who is harvesting it? Where is that grain ending up? Right? It raises a lot of questions. But this is a true color image. It is. So we have an algorithm to detect the harvest not harvested. We end up with this kind of a map showing what has been harvested, what hasn't been harvested. Not surprisingly, it's concentrated along the front line. That means we can finally put out our production estimates and we can put them out by Ukrainian controlled territories and occupied territories. And so um, we come up with our numbers. Our numbers are much higher than everybody else's numbers. Uh, and we're the only ones apparently putting out information. Well, that year, like some agencies you have to understand, provide information, at least that year still, on all of Ukraine's territory. The ministry in Ukraine was providing it only on their controlled territory. So you can imagine, like, as an economist, right, this starts to be pretty confusing. Each agency, some agencies, FAO was reporting on Ukraine minus Crimea. So that already starts to create some confusion and thinking about this is a pretty important country to understand what's going on. Okay, so we're putting out these numbers. We see that about 22% of production is coming from the occupied territory. 5.8 million tons. And initially we put that number out and turns out people don't know to understand, is that a lot? Is that not a lot? So we say, okay, we'll convert it to, to dollars. It's about $1.2 billion worth of grain that's been harvested in the occupied territories. It's about um, the total production of Kansas wheat for those Americans. Kansas is the big wheat state in the US from this year. Okay, so it's not a negligible amount of wheat. It's about 60% of the imports of Egypt. Egypt is the biggest importer of wheat in the world. So we can't ignore the, the magnitude of, of how much. And that's here we're just talking about wheat. And so as you can see, I put some numbers down there on, on the bottom in terms of other organizations, what their numbers were at, at the time. The ministry does end up using our numbers. They use our information along with other information to make decisions also about um, their, their exports. They don't put out an export ban, right? That's really important because when countries that are big exporters put an export ban, that translates into price increases for everybody, okay? So this is important to have this kind of information. Where did the 22% of Ukraine's production end up? Who got the economic benefits, right? There were a lot of media articles and, and people coming out with information. There were a lot of stories that verified, right? That, that ships were going out of the occupied territories, meeting ships in the Black Sea, going dark, transferring the grain over, and that becomes official Russian grain. Um, okay, then uh, one of the things we're also doing is looking at crater detection, artillery crater. So it's largely work by uh, Eric Duncan and, and, and Sergei Skakun. And so here we're looking at a field, hopefully you can see this, 
on the left side is a, in a um, true color image, right? Like it's what you would see with your eyes. You see those black dots, those are all artillery craters. The blue is the satellite de automated detection um, of those craters. And so we can map those across the whole front line. And this is kind of a heat map showing the concentration of those. This is still a work in, in progress. We've mapped over 2.5 million artillery um, impact. Why is this important, right? So we know that when there is um, artillery craters, some of those are unexploded, right? Some proportion, and that's gonna depend on the artillery and how old it was. So the, I think there are estimates anywhere between three and 50%, depending on, on which artillery is, can be unexploded. And so that becomes really, really important information for, for many reasons, but this is all um, in largely in agricultural areas. So we're working to try to work also with different humanitarian demining operators to try to see how do we provide this kind of information. And so we can put the field boundaries, remember that we developed before, and we can do a concentration of how many um, uh, craters are within agricultural fields. And some fields end up with over a thousand craters. I think we've had some field with 3,500 craters in a single field. Then there's the Kakovka Dam collapse. So we get a phone call saying, hey, can you estimate how much croplands have been flooded due to the Kakovka Dam? We have an estimate that was really large. This was from the ministry. So we do this analysis again within two days. And what we find is a really, really small area actually of croplands has been flooded. Um, of course, villages were flooded and we can map, we can see those. So here you're seeing the, the, the area that was flooded overlaid on top of it in yellow are different um, villages. It was devastating. But the concern for croplands was not how many croplands were flooded. That was very small. The concern is the irrigation. Okay, this is a semi-dry area, semi-arid area within Ukraine. You have a pretty large network of irrigation canals, a large dependency on irrigation for crop production in, in this area. And what we start to monitor um, is the inlets to these canals. And so how, here I'm just showing one. This is a North Crimean Canal inlet. We see it on June 5th, right, the day before. So that's what we're looking at here. It's all blue, you see the water and it's flowing in. And this is June 30th and we could kind of track this as time is going. It's completely dry, the canal inlet is completely dry, okay? And so the concern for agriculture is much more around the, the availability of irrigation water. Of course, it was also contamination of water. There were a lot of other concerns, um, but I'm gonna really focus here on, on the agriculture. Okay, so the reservoir goes from being full to being completely empty. And so we are still working on analyzing what was the impact on irrigation. Okay, so here we're showing, and this is still a work in progress, where this is not complete, um, but this is looking at irrigation 2021 and zoomed into an area that's highly concentrated, a lot of pivot irrigation in this area. The blues are our detection of irrigation. This is 2021. Okay, 2022, we see some decline, but still a lot of irrigation. And remember, this area is all in fully Russian occupied territories. Okay, so this is where the big impact is. This is 2023, almost none is anymore irrigated, okay? So this has um, big implications and we'll be continuing to monitor this. Okay, so now we get to 2023. We're running all the same analysis. I'm not, oops, I'm not gonna go through all the details I did in, in the previous one, but I'm gonna show you something else that really stood out to us, okay? So here again, we're back to 2021 in July and we're looking at this frontline area. That's that zoom in in the top. And then we look at Oops, skipped one. 2022, we see some of that those features that I showed you earlier, the dark versus the bright. And then we have 2023. And what stands out here is that we have all of a sudden a lot of pretty intense green along the front line. And so intuitively you would think, okay, what is that? Like cropland's doing really well, but no. So if you think about your, these are abandoned croplands, okay? So if you think about your garden and you have pretty fertile soil and you have rain, it's not gonna stay bare, it's gonna get pretty green. And so what we end up is mapping this, we're trying to estimate how much of this cropland has actually been abandoned. And, um, and essentially what we end up seeing is that this vegetation greens up with the winter crops or around with winter wheat, but it stays green throughout the whole summer. And that's the signal that we are detecting. And so this is all that red, right? You see the front line um, very clearly, you can see the dam is, is now empty. Um, and we 
added to it, this was somebody else's layer, but the, the yellow are Russian fortifications that, that, that somebody has, I think, manually delineated on satellite imagery. And what you see is that it really bounds kind of what we are finding as uh, our detections of abandoned land. Makes a lot of sense, right? And what you also see on here, is this working? Um, where should I be pointing this to? Okay, here we go. Okay, so here you see this wide area, right? This was initially the front line. This got liberated. Similarly here in her song, this got liberated. Here, probably if you're closer and, and zoomed in, you actually see a line also in here of, um, whoops, that was the front line in 2014, right? The initial uh, invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, okay, so what we do is we estimate that approximately 7% of Ukraine's cropland has been abandoned in 2023. This translates to about $2 billion worth of a crop that has been lost, right? So it wasn't planted. And more importantly, if we translate this, making some assumptions, okay, into how many people, if this had been cultivated, had been planted and harvested, could it have fed? Over 25 million people for a year, okay? Just this area that's been abandoned. Um, so that's really significant. I'm gonna quickly show you kind of, this is a series of satellite imagery just to show you what these fortifications look like. Um, here you don't see anything. There's no, here you can start to see this line building up. I don't know why the, the dates are not here. I think this is January. Um, these continue going, it's continued to, to grow. I think this is in uh, late January. Um, we see it now in the spring, I think this is May. And then we see these fields, right? So we see all these have been planted before this structure had come in, these were a winter crop. They get harvested just below this line, right? So um, just to give you a sense of, of what we're able to see. Okay, so we end up doing the numbers also for 2023. We see an overall decrease in planted area. Crop Winter crop area remains about the same, but we do see a large shift in the Ukrainian held territories to rapeseed. That makes a lot of sense. It's, it's a, um, a cash crop um, and there's a lot of demand for that also in Europe. We don't see that same increase in the occupied territories. That also makes sense. They're not gonna be able to export that into Europe, okay? Um, we see some decrease area in, in summer planted area and we see an overall increase in wheat production because I'll bite a smaller area, Yields were good because of good weather. And the Ministry of uh, Agriculture just put out a press release with our numbers uh, two days ago on, on Wednesday. Um, and here I've put a, a quote, I won't read it, from the first deputy minister about this kind of work and the importance of it for uh, their own assessments. And this work has gotten a lot of media attention, um, has been published a lot in different articles. And I think, um, again, kind of another quote from the minister who wrote a letter to the NASA administrator about the importance of this work and actually contributed to their decision not to put out an export ban in, in 2022. So um, this is, I think, my last slide. And so what one of the lessons learned we've had under NASA Harvest and somewhere where we're going with all of this is to develop a center that we can re receive these kinds of requests, right? You can't predict them ahead of time. But we know with, with the climate crisis, we know we're gonna have more extreme weather events that are gonna impact agriculture. We have conflict across the world. It's not, off, sometimes it's related, sometimes it's not related to climate, but we do see climate related conflicts. Conflicts can have, as we see, major implications, whether it's in big export countries, or if you look like one of the requests we're working on right now is from the D Democratic Republic of Congo, looking at there's some discrepancy between um, different organizations in terms of how many people are need food aid, for example, how much croplands was impacted or impacted. So that has much more of a local context, but still really important. Um, and then you have issues of transparency, right? Some countries, perhaps Russia at the moment, is less transparent about how much they're producing. They're the number one eat wheat exporter. Um, you have other countries that, for example, if, if um, China tomorrow has a drought and, uh, and comes and starts to import more than usual from international markets, it's really important to have information of these kinds of countries, right? So those are other kinds of requests that we also receive. And so one of the things we're trying very much to move forward right now is to develop a new center that can be receptive to these kinds of, of requests. Recognizing satellite data becomes a really important tool. But it's only useful, and this is something I should have highlighted in the beginning, if we're working very, very closely with the people who need this information, okay? We can't sit on one side of the world, think up what do we think will be useful, 
create information and maps and expect somebody in a policymaker is going to use it. That's never going to happen. And you will usually run the wrong analysis, right? So it's really important that this is driven by the end user, whether it's a UN organization, whether it's a government, whether it's an insurance company, that has to be this partnership. It has to be guided, it has to be done and in, in, together in order to ultimately make an impact on difference. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So let's open it up for questions. And if you're online, then please type your questions in the comment box and I will see them. But um, before we start, let, let me use my prerogative and ask yes. something that might be a stupid question, but what, I mean, I, I fully understand the importance of this work, but why NASA? <laughs> okay, so we, uh, yeah, sorry. Good question. Um, NASA and other space agencies put in a lot of public money into putting up these satellites, right? And the purpose of it is to make sure that these are being used. There's still a tremendous amount of potential for being able to uptake and use this kind of information. And so NASA has within its earth science program, um, different application areas. It's focused on water, it's focused on disasters, it's focused on agriculture, it's focused on health. All of those are very much meant to be able to increase the uptake and the use of these kinds of data to ultimately make impactful decisions. Thank you. So Not a stupid question at all, <laughs> very good one. Okay, so, Anna Marie, uh, just a second, we'll, we need to wait for the microphone. So this data, I'm sure, would be very useful for economists. And I'm wondering whether it's available for academic research or whether it is so expensive uh, that at the end it's not really used for academic research. Sure, good good question. I think a lot of our initial applications, especially the crop monitor, has only become successful because we were working very closely with economists. Because initially what we provided was like NDVI anomalies and maps and things, and they said, we have no idea what this means. Um, so satellite data, like all NASA data, all European Space Agency data are free and open. Anybody can go and use them. Of course, it requires a lot of know-how to process the data, to pr produce information out of the data itself. Um, and so I think like our, for example, our work on in Ukraine, and usually we try to make everything available. Our specific work in, in Ukraine, we make our ultimate results available, but because of the sensitivity of this data, we actually have agreement with the government that that data you know, at the field scale does not become available to. Um, but the statistics, of course, we've been publishing and, and putting out. So I think there's a lot more room for collaboration between the remote sensing, world and the economics world. And I think, you know, a lot of it is like in any other discipline, right? We've got to figure out to, how to talk the same languages and how to come together because there are so many powerful tools and so many know-hows that if we can come together better, we can we can get at a lot more impactful solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Hello, thank you for being here. I'm Alessandra. Uh, I have a question. It's not mainly on Ukraine. Uh, but I was wondering if you noticed in the, in the recent years a switch to more resilient crops uh, due to climate change, and if you have some examples, and if you could talk a little bit about that to us. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a, a very good question. There's a lot of work in that space of sustainability, right? And what do we even mean by sustainable practices and sustainable agriculture? Um, there is some research that goes on that tries to look at, you know, under, uh, for example, under flooding conditions or under stress conditions, can you detect fields that, let's say, had been low till for 10 years, did they fare better than fields that that weren't, right? So there's a lot of that kind of research, a lot of research trying to give more information around where are you having higher risks? Where do you have to adapt? What would, you know, in terms of questions of suitability and how do you change the, the, the practices? I think a lot of this space is now moving into, especially with satellite data, trying to understand which practices work best where, right? And what are their implications and how do you then scale those up into policy decisions, into insurance programs, into incentives for farmers to be able to adopt those more. 
Um, so there are shifts that are are happening. I think it's still a lot of in the research domain to see how much has that already been successful. Where have you seen more adaptation? Um, and versus trying to look at, you know, where are climate risks increasing and, and where do we see more variability and vulnerability in agricultural production? Yes, please. Thank you so much for this talk. This was tremendously interesting to see science application. As a disclaimer, I'm an aerospace engineer myself, and I've seen how much space agencies struggle to find applications for the satellite data. Um, are you able to comment a bit more on this type of satellites you use, or the, the images, and maybe a little bit on the on the indicators? Because um, I know there's a lot of stuff out there, and you said it's not publicly available, so I guess you use some... Sort of not publicly available data. Sure. You're asking specifically about our Ukraine work? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, we primarily used for this uh, planet data, right? So that's a commercial company. Uh, they provide data at the three meter resolution. The main reason we did that initially is because Ukraine during the growing season is really, really cloudy. And the advantage of planet data, we didn't need three meter resolution. The fields in Ukraine are humongous. We could have easily used Sentinel, even, you know, a lot of applications with MODIS work fine. Um, but the, the reason we did that is we had that daily cadence. And so if you have, even if you have like a small area of your image that doesn't have a cloud, you want to capture that. And together you can kind of think about it as a puzzle and, and, and you're obviously well familiar, like what we call composites. So you're taking from every day that you have whatever cloud free scene you have, and you can build that into, a, you know, in this case, what we used is biweekly composites, right? So we take two weeks worth of data and we grab from each location in there, the cloud free data set. And that's how we get to cloud free or close to cloud free data. And so that's what we, we use. So it is commercial data. That meant that, you know, um, planet estimated that the value of data they gave us was $5 million. We didn't of course pay it. It also meant we can't, you know, also on that level, we can't, um, share the, the, the planet data itself. We did also use for a lot of the analysis radar data, so Sentinel-1, especially for mapping the um, sunflower, and also for some of the soil disturbance, SAR data becomes much more suitable. And is that spectral? We had the four band, so we didn't even use the eight band, so we had NIR invisible. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of kind of I mean, a lot of what we did in Ukraine was very, you know, wouldn't be like a normal model you would develop, but it was very much driven by kind of continuously looking at the data and our, a lot of our domain knowledge to try to guide, you know, we did some semi-supervised models for, for doing this in, in particular in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Georgi? Yeah. Hi, uh, Georgi Kent, first year here at SAIS. Um, and so I, I got a question. In one of the earlier slides, it showed that um, Ukraine, parts of Southern Russia were yellow, probably conflict related, but then also, um, I think the Eastern Balkans, Romania, Bulgaria. Oh, first slide. Yeah, first slide was was shown the poor yeah. harvest. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more yeah. about that. Actually, some of those conditions have changed. So in the publication we're going to have on Thursday, you'll see that change. There was some initial concern in, in Ukraine and parts in Russia of dry conditions with the So that was mainly looking at the winter planting, right? So right now they're planting the, the winter crops. So also very, very early on in the season, if you, we'll often see like a yellow or a warning of dry conditions in the early season. That's usually not really that concerning necessarily because you have the rest of the seasons to still recover. Um, but that is most of those are actually going to change. The red remains because it's on the the occupied side, and that was kind of what the agencies agreed on to to continue to or I think um, to put on a, a warning on on that side. Um, if I recall correctly, I think parts of northern Europe had very heavy rainfall, and so that also had implications for delays in planting of of the. The winter crops and i think other parts had some dry conditions as well but the new the updated one will come out on thursday and so a lot of that area has changed thanks thank you uh, before that we have a question online so it's actually a question in two parts so what is the what is the immediate aftermath because of the loss of millions of tons of wheat and other crop production onto the international market in terms of us dollars and are there any significant effects here? Or did other huge producers like India and China has already carved the demand and, and address this issue? I'll give my answer and then I think economists can probably uh, elaborate on that. 
Uh, I think initially we saw prices going way up, like right when the war started and then uh, have since come down. I think we have been very lucky that there has been other countries that have had good production, right? And so there wasn't a very big stress on international markets in terms of wheat availability. Um, had we seen that, I think that, you know, 6 million tons would have been bigger. I also think that, um, you know, the 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 amount I said that was lost due to the abandoned land was a combination of wheat, corn, sunflower. So, so it was a combination of, of all those when, when I gave those numbers. But when we look at what's being produced in the occupied territories, right, so that's also on the order of six, that's on the order of six million tons of just wheat, a lot of that is making it into international markets, right? It's just kind of in nobody's balance sheet. And so that's one of the issues that we keep trying to bring forward that we think is really critical, is that we do have information on that. Thank you. Jack? Hi, uh, Jack Kennedy, second year Maya student. Um, since you're working so much on a Ukraine conflict related issue and, and so closely with the, the Ukrainian government, is there any organizational sort of difficulty or strangeness produced by the fact that NASA continues to work quite closely with Roscosmos on, on various things? Or are you sufficiently insulated from the kind of human space flight end of NASA and a sufficiently big organization that that, that, that isn't a factor? Good question. Um, I don't know if I should have a lawyer here from NASA. Um, let me think carefully of my words and I can have it all. Uh, we are um, we are sufficiently insulated, I would say. I think we, you know, all, overall the the U.S. government is very strongly in support of Ukraine NASA as a government organization. Um, but I think we, we're not political, right? We're NASA. We are science driven. What we're doing is providing data and information. We are not getting into the politics. We are not one saying where is the grain gone? Who's harvested it, right? That's not what we do. We are giving the data. It's been harvested. This is how much production has been on this part versus that part. So, and we're remaining on the data and transparency side. So there's really no issue with what we're doing, given that that's our goal and that our mission and what we do. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Um, I have two very quick questions and then third long. Um, so though, uh, uh, I saw there was a headline that said 22% of cropland is within Russian territory. You said 7% is crop of cropland is abandoned. Um, so do we, is it the belief that 15% is commandeered and to be Russian wheat, or it's just going to Russia or different parts of um, that territory? Um, if you want, really. and let me make sure that I've understood. so the twenty two percent was in the beginning of the war, right? Like Ukraine has actually gained back a lot of territory, so that you know, so that front line that was like the number we came out with, I think, back in like early on in in the war. In terms of the abandoned land, we looked at it across that front line, right? So there are parts that are in the Ukrainian side, parts in the in the Russian side. But I don't know if that was your question. Oh, no, seven percent of cropland is of like all of that, Ukraine. That's Ukraine. Oh, of all it. Ukrainian cropland. Okay. Sorry, I should have been Thank more clear on that. Yep. Um, uh, and that'll add to my third question. Uh, so are you working with Halo and other demining NGOs? Yeah. We're, ta we're, we're talking with, with them, with them and, the and FSD and yep, different okay. demining organizations. To, to detect the, whether or not it's unexploded or not based on the size of the crater or not that? No, and, and yeah, this is really work done by, by um, Eric Duncan, who's looking a lot at this, but what you can see are the craters, right? So what you, you don't see the unexploded ones, but you know that when you have a higher concentration of those, you're very likely going to have unexploded ordinance. But what we're also seeing is a lot of those fields are being cultivated. And that raises for us a lot of questions around are they, you know, we know there's a lot of demining activities going on by farmers because they can't afford to wait till official demining uh, organizations come in. We also don't know if some of them are just taking a risk and that those craters are deep down into the soil that if they till the upper layer, they're not exploding. We don't know. Okay. And then I was volunteering in um, Mikulive in April of 2021 and no, sorry, 2022. And so um, I was curious and the cropland seemed very much like an afterthought at the time. Obviously the invasion just started, but I was curious about um, the land around the the battle lines like mm -hmm. what by and large are you seeing that those are it's kind of split whether or not they're abandoned or not or what are you seeing like around that line like obviously McLeod was never taken over mm -hmm. but like it was I was just curious what you're seeing so the closer we are to the active front line the more those fields are abandoned like so we see vegetation growing in them but it's not cultivated 
fields or, or, or crops. And then the further away you get from it, we're seeing more and more um, cultivation. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hello, my name is Anastasia, Ukrainian student here. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for um, supporting my country these days. And hopefully one day your data will help to calculate reparations Russia will yeah. pay to Ukraine. That's part of it, yeah. um, the question I have, I'm very much interested in uh, soil contamination due to the, um, you know, uh, war. Um, do you think that um, satellite images may be helpful to identify contaminated soil in Ukraine? Another good question. We have been asked that before. I know there's a lot of studies ongoing about doing different soil samples in, in those areas. There has been work in the past with hyperspectral data that looks at soil and soil contamination that's absolutely outside of my area of expertise. Um, but I, I think more of that work, like my guess would be is that you would wanna use satellite as an indicator, right? Here are the areas that have both heavenly, most heavily shelled. Here's an area that there was infrastructure that's been damaged that would have had chemical leaks, right? And so we'd use that more as an indicator to then go on on the ground and do that kind of a research rather than directly using the satellite data for monitoring the contamination. Sure. Hi, I'm Sadie Hilf. I'm a first year MAAR student. Uh, you had talked a little bit about at the beginning about monitoring um, drying uh, reservoirs in Somalia. And I was wondering that as you guys are kind of compiling the data on that type of thing, you are, um, if at one point that type of data would be able to to be used to predict um, sort of like water wars that people are predicting primarily coming out of the Middle East and Africa as that kind of exacerbates? So again, I think what we want to do is to be guided by those who are trying to make those predictions, right? And so we might work if we had such a request, like we would work with them to do the analysis, but we certainly, you know, that's where our job would end and they would then use that kind of data for looking at um, those kinds of questions. I mean, there's a lot of work also looking at extended outlooks, right? So trying to understand if you take, you know, the areas where you have the best skill in different um, climate forecasts, where might you have multiple shortfalls? And so a lot of this is already happening. We're involved in that FUSENET, USAID's um, famine early warning system is very heavily engaged in that kind of work. Again, from a humanitarian side of trying to understand where might you have crises or may, where might you have kind of multiple countries in 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 crisis and trying to have an outlook as early as possible, recognizing there's a lot of uncertainty and that, that kind of work. But yeah, yeah, good question. Thank you. Thanks. It's been fascinating. I guess I have a question about the center you mentioned at the end for rapid agricultural assessments for policy support, because you've sort of listed so many ways this data can be used. And I wondered, where do you see the biggest demand? Like who's coming to you most? And do you have lots of competitors doing this kind of work? Are you guys the only ones out there? Um, and what's the blockage to kind of making this sort of information more readily available for policymakers in the way that you're describing? Because it seems like it's immensely useful what you've just described that you can deliver the Ministry of Agriculture. Right. Um, yeah. So that's, let me try to remember all the, the, the parts of it. I think, what was the first one? Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah. So we've seen kind of an increasing and a growing demand in these. And one, in part, as as different organizations realize this is possible, right, there's more requests for this kind of work. So we've had demand from kind of the Agricultural Market Information System, which is part of the G20. It's hosted out at FAO. Um, and they're one of the ones that is very supportive of starting up this center. And so that's, of course, made up of 10 different international organizations or 11 plus the G20 governments plus a few other um, countries. So we, we get requests from, from that forum. We get requests from different U.S. government agencies. Um, we get, you know, I, I, we've had a request, for example, from um, insurance when there was like the derecho, a big storm in, in Iowa that destroyed a lot of the corn. So the, the, the requests come from different organizations. Um, I would say there's a big gap in filling that demand because a lot of people assume that that's the job of WFP. Right, World Food Program. That's the job of FAO. That's a world of FuseNet. That's a job of USDA. And in fact, 
It's part of it, but they're not set up to do these rapid satellite, very detailed driven assessments. They all have experts in satellite data, um, but sometimes they're the ones who are coming to us with those requests. And so I think part of the challenge of getting this set up is that there's an assumption that this exists, but it doesn't exist in this kind of a of a form that's a center very much ready to work with all those organizations actually to 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 support them. There are a lot of organizations that have this kind of capacity and and support. But again, nobody's set up to like, you know, on demand. Like if you think about how organizations are funded, projects are funded, you have your your work. And so when there's a request coming in, that means you've got to have the 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 capacity to take that on right away and not not grow and shrink all the time in terms of as as requests come in. So it is a challenge that we're trying to think through in terms of how do you get this thing going? How do you get the demand there? How do you um get this uh, started up and leveraging this large network that we have built through GeoGlam in terms of groups across the globe that have these kinds of expertise. And so how do we build that community of remote sensors being able to then be responsive to these kinds of requests? So I think there's a huge potential. Thank you. Georgi? Yeah. Uh, another question. Um, you mentioned, and you kind of uh, skipped over the slide on private-public partnership in this space. And then the question here kind of revealed, oh, there's commercially available uh, satellite data that you're using and incorporating. Uh, so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that um, and whether it's on the, the data side or if it's on the client side and how you, how you manage those partnerships. Sure, um, it's on both, right? So we have developed a big partnership with Planet. They're one of the ones that I think we're, you know, moving forward and developing this kind of center. They recognize that their data could be tremendously useful for these kinds of analysis. But a lot of our private sector partnerships have actually been with, you know, for example, one of, I think one of the examples I was showing there is a company in Argentina that's providing like scouting services to farmers. Can we provide them with yield analytics and analysis for, for farmers? We have a new partnership with another company also now working in, in Brazil on sustainability. We have a partnership with with an insurance company on looking at how to use satellite data to drive their sampling to be more efficient and to reduce the number of fields that they have to go visit on the ground. So it's quite broadly focused in terms of the private sector partnerships that we have, but we recognize that that's a really important space in, in agriculture. Thanks. Okay, let, let me ask, let me jump in and ask another one. So in your list of agricultural production. I mean, you talked about wheat, you talked about, I think, oil, corn. What about sugar wheat? <laughs> Which is an important source of Ukrainian agriculture. And I, and I don't think I heard you talking about sugar at all. So. That's right. Um, we have not in the past worked on sugar specifically. We've focused on large commodity crops or in particular locations like food security crops. We have gotten that question and actually are looking into a partnership with an agri holding company in Ukraine that is specifically focused on sugar beet as one of their crops. Um, so I will keep you posted on that if we do move forward on working with them on that. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions online or here? Yeah, so there is another question online. So what are your thoughts on the potential use of NISAR, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, in the future specifically for agriculture and cropland imaging, and how would that help NASA's current tools for spectroscopy and its derived data? We're very excited about NISAR. NISAR is a NASA-India collaboration, Israel on, on the Indian side, a radar satellite. Um, I think we 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 have somebody in 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 our team who's part of the science team there, so we're uh, very excited for this new capability, um, and we're looking forward to we're right now looking at different applications where we will be able to use NISAR data. Thank you. Thanks. Well, that answers it. Any other questions? Yes, I'm just uh, just just wait for the microphone. Um, you mentioned before that uh, from 2022 to 2023, Ukrainian farmers started growing more rapeseed comparing to wheat. Uh, were there any other uh, adaptations that Ukrainian farmers adopted in order to um, sort of, you know, maintain their incomes during the war? Um, we heard, I think, that there was some increase in buckwheat, but we're not specifically monitoring buckwheat. Um, we have seen a continue. We, a lot still of sunflower maintained being produced. So if you think about it, ultimately we saw there was a 
decrease in total planted area, um, a shift some within the winter crops to rapeseed. And then the summer crops, we did see still a large proportion being cultivated as sunflower, which means that other summer crops were probably somewhat reduced relative to that. Yeah, but one of the reasons for sunflower is one, it's a cash crop. It also requires less um, fertilizer and not energy for drying the grain at the at the end. So that made a lot of sense to see that. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I have a few more technical questions later, but this one could be interesting. Do you use any ground truthing? Because it's one thing to estimate changes in yield from satellite data. The other thing is to estimate an absolute value. Very good question. So normally I would stand up here and say, don't ever do anything without ground data and validating, um, except for when you get in the situation well where you have none. So that's, for example, why we didn't we didn't do corn, because um, what we did was when we, we ran our, our map, any map, as all of you will know, has errors in it, that, which is why you cannot just count up your, your pixels and, and make an area estimate. So what we do is we do a statistical frame on top of that, right? Like we'll run, um, we'll, we'll do stratified random samples, and then we'll go validate each one of those samples. And so winter crops largely are, um, winter cereals largely are wheat and, and barley. We can confidently, when we do that stratified sample, we can confidently identify those. Um, we then use a proportion from the ministry in terms of separating out how much wheat is to, to barley. Um, similarly, sunflower, we can differentiate because of its nature, its helioscopic nature, and we're doing that with SAR data. And so we can, again, when we go to validate those points, even though we don't have ground data, um, we can confidently label those points. We can't confidently label corn at the moment, at least, without having the ground data, which is why we're not giving a, a corn number or a soybean number for, for, for that matter. Um, what did give us confidence is when we've made our estimates now, both in 2022 and in 2023, when we've compared them to the ministry's number for the Ukrainian held territories, our numbers are extremely close. Um, and so we're using obviously very different web methods or different information. So that gives us a lot of confidence in what we're doing to be able to then run the same approaches in the occupied territories. We also had some collaboration with Natalia Kusil's group in, in, in Ukraine who did collect ground data in 2022 in the Ukrainian controlled territories. And I think like our map had about 94% accuracy relative to the data that they had collected. But yeah, ground truth in general, like is critical and being able to validate and kind of look at your uncertainty is extremely important. Thank you, Georgi. A question about uh, sugar beet uh, production had me thinking about whether or not a limitation of this method is uh, root vegetables and how, how visible they are from, from satellite imagery. And I'm not an expert in what they look like, to be completely honest. Uh, I've you know, dug some onions out of the ground, but I don't know, really know what, what potatoes look like versus beets and everything else. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. So in Ukraine, a lot of these are grown in pretty small plots. So they're much, 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 much smaller than the kind of big commodity fields and, and crops. And we're really monitoring the big commodity crops. We're not in, you know, of course, vegetables are a really important source of nu nutrients and, 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 you know, there's a lot of other work that does on that, but we're, that wasn't our, our focus. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Well, if not, then I will finish with my last question. So if one of our students or not just students here is absolutely fascinated by your talk and wants to move to this space, you know, from the international relations background. So what would you advise them to do or oh, us? Uh, contact me. I'm happy to talk to you and to hear more about what you're interested in and how I try to help to guide you to other contacts or people that you might be interested in working with. Thank you. So please join me in thanking him, but it was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.